Good evening. Welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Whether you're here in the theater with us physically or joining us on our YouTube station. Before we hear from Henry Louis Gates Jr., Maria Tatar, and our moderator, Alelia Bundles, I'd like to alert you to two other programs coming up this month. On Thursday, January 18th at 7 p.m., we'll show the Emmy Award winning HBO documentary, Dear America, Letters Home from Vietnam. Based on the book of the same name, this 1987 film features actors and actresses reading actual letters home from men and women serving in the Vietnam War. Then on Thursday, January 25th at 7 p.m., Eric P. Villard and a panel will discuss the Tet Offensive and Villard's book, Combat Operations, Staying the Course, September 1967 to October 1968. Former Senator Chuck Hagel will give keynote remarks and a book signing will follow that program. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events online at archives.gov. Check out our website to sign up uh, where you can get email updates also. You'll find information about other National Archives programs and activities. And another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our education and outreach activities. And there are applications for membership in the lobby. Or you can become a member online at archivesfoundation.org. And a little known secret that I keep telling everyone, no one has ever been turned down for membership in the National Archives Foundation. One more thing, another after tonight's program in the theater, you'll be able to buy copies of this very heavy book, The Annotated African American Folk Tales, and get them signed by our authors. The largest single category of researchers using the National Archives is that fa pursuing family history. People visit our website and come in person to our research rooms here in Washington and across the country to examine our documents, searching for names, dates, and events to fill out their family stories. With every piece of evidence they find, they're building connections and enlarging communities. They may verify a, discount, a discount or discount some of the stories, but either way, the stories remain part of their family heritage because they have been repeated and handed down for generations. Folk tales, repeated and handed down for many, many generations, connect communities on a wider scale and convey lessons, warnings, and encouragement to the listeners. Over the last few years, Professor Gates has tapped into the curiosity about where we came from in his PBS series, Finding Your Roots. Now he and Maria Tatar bring to the forefront a collection of the shared folk tales from the African and African-American tradition. So let's hear from tonight's panelists about the annotated African-American folk tales. Henry Louis Gates, Jr. is the Alphonse Fletcher University professor and director of the Hutchins Center for African and African-American Research at Harvard University an Emmy Award-winning filmmaker, literary scholar, journalist, cultural critic, and institution builder. Professor Gates has authored or co-authored 21 books and created 20, 15 documentary films. Finding Your Roots, his groundbreaking genealogy television series, is now filming its fifth season on PBS. Maria Tatar is the John L. Loeb Professor of Germanic Languages and Literature and of Folklore and Mythology at Harvard University, the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Professor Tata has written for the New York Times, the New Republic, and the Harvard Crimson. Her work has been featured on the Today Show and in Harvard Magazine. In Alelia Bundles, our moderator, author, and journalist, is working on her fifth book, the Joy Goddess of Harlem, Alelia Walker and the Harlem Renaissance, a biography of her great-grandmother whose parties, friendships, international travels, and arts patronage helped define the era. Alelia was a network television news executive and producer for 30 years at NBC News and then at ABC News, where she was the Washington, D.C. Deputy Bureau Chief. And at the end of last year, Aaliyah stepped down after six years as chair of the National 
Archives Foundation Board of Directors. So this is another opportunity for us to thank Alelia for her service and to let you all know that her latest accomplishment is a book for children all about Madam C.J. Walker. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Alelia Bundles, Skip Gates, and Maria Tatar. Walk around. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. It's warmed up. I was worried on Monday whether we'd have anybody here, but thank you all for coming. <laughs> we have a great crowd. This is just going to be fun tonight. Um, this, does, does everybody have his and her book? <laughs> Multiple copies. So my friend Skip, Professor Henry Louis Gates, and Professor Maria Tatar um, have done a really wonderful job of just reviving and bringing respect to folk tales. And when you read the book, you will see that there has been a debate for a long time, the politics of respectability which Maria and Skip's um, colleague, Evelyn Higginbotham, uh, talked about. But to know that Anna Julia Cooper, uh, who was uh, being described as the person who cared a lot about the politics of respectability, in fact was one of the key advocates for resurrecting folktales. So I'd like for you all to talk to me a little bit about this journey from these old slave tales and um, rural tales that people were a little bit ashamed of to where we are now, to bringing this respect? I think that's a great question. We tend to forget. I think that the younger generation doesn't even understand how complicated the recollection of slavery was within the African American community. You know, I was an undergraduate at Yale as you know, between when you were at Harvard. Um, well, I'm, a little, I'm so much older than Alelia. Yes, I'm like sorry. one and a half years, uh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but John Blasgame published The Slave Community in 1972. That's the first full-length book written by a black historian about slavery using the testimony of the slaves. And that's a fact. And it was very controversial in the historical profession the uh, testimony of, of the slaves. They would take the testimony of the master, but not the testimony of the slaves. Well, the corollary of that was within the African-American community, after, even during Reconstruction, what's, what's our intellectual relationship to slavery? The first example is the Jubilee, Fish Jubilee Singers. And many of them who wrote memoirs talked about the debates that they had among themselves about whether they would sing what Du Bois called the sorrow songs or what we call the spirituals or the religious songs, the sacred songs invented by slaves because they found them embarrassing. And they thought that it was very important for them to establish that they could sing high canonical Western songs in a highly arranged way. And people would say, yeah, that's fine, but give me you know, um, go down death, you know, or I, I, I want to hear, <laughs> give me one of those old Negro spirituals. Well, when Maria and I were editing this volume, and I was um, tasked with writing my part of the introduction, I just stumbled into this debate about folklore, and I knew it from an essay that Ar Arthur Fawcett wrote in the New Negro in 1925, but I hadn't traced it back, and so I looked at um, this volume done by Don Waters about the Southern workmen and the collection of slavery at Hampton. And gradually, I worked my way back to this huge argument that unfolded in 1892 and 1893 and throughout the 1890s about whether it was a good idea for the soon-to-be New Negro, and the New Negro movement really starts in 1894, 1895, to be recollecting these tales, animal tales, and signifying and lying and talking about Africans flying back to Africa. Was that a good idea? Brer Rabbit, Brer Bear? Is, is this how the new Negro is going to position him and herself vis-a-vis -vis the white racism that was a, um, a part and parcel of the institutionalization of Jim Crow, the rollback of Reconstruction? 
or not? Should we shut the door on slavery? Why? Because the, these tales were told in dialect. And dialect is the linguistic remnant of slavery. And, and it's difficult for people not to internalize their own oppression. So as you know, and as you know very well, um, there were huge debates about how you confront anti-black racism. Should we all wear three-piece suits to bed? <laughs> 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 Never go out in public with the, I don't know, with, with your hair in rollers. This is mm -hmm. stuff that, I, I'll give you another example. The swimming pool, I'm from Piedmont, West Virginia, which is three hours up the Potomac, um, past Cumberland. That's where all my family, my fourth great grandparents, three sets of free Negroes from the 18th century and early 19th century, lived 18 miles from where I was born. Okay. In our little county, Mineral County, um, Brown v. Boards of 1954, Mineral County, West Virginia, integrated in 1955. There only a handful of black people out there. <laughs> but the swimming pool, and so I started first grade in 1956 with, at the white school, as we would call it, right? The swimming pool didn't integrate Maria until 1957 because all that nudity and sexuality, you know, they had to sneak up on the idea of integrating the swimming pool. What's this have to do with all this? I'm going to tell you. My mother, and I love to swim, my brother, Paul, we would go to the swimming pool every day. And my mother would give us a little lunch and give us Avon moisturizing cream. <laughs> Why? Because she would say, now, Skippy, when you get out of the water, you got to dry yourself off, and you got to put the Avon moisturizing cream because you can't look crusty or ashy in front of white people. People <laughs> embarrass us. This is 1957. I was seven years old. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what I looked at. I was all lathered up, had white stuff all over me. <laughs> <laughs> that, in small, was uh, prefigured by these huge debates over Negro folklore, as, as we would call it. Was it embarrassing to recall tales about Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Bear, and Br'er Fox, or was that um, a good thing for the race? And Anna Julia Cooper made this amazing speech in May of 1893, which we reprint here, in which she said, uh, only an idiot doesn't understand that these tales are a sign of genius, that people, the way people survived, that they had a take on their own being in the world. Um, what I think of as a second order reflection, when you could do a thing and reflect on yourself doing a thing. These are people oppressed in the most horrid circumstances, and still they found a way to allegorize their situation through Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Bear. That's genius. Let me just That's mention genius. one thing here, because everybody doesn't know who Anna Julia Cooper was, and what a scholar she was. So I think that is a little interesting perspective. Sure. Well, she was one of the, um, uh, uh, she was a prototypical black feminist, leading black intellectual. Um, where and when I entered there, the Negro race enters with me. She wrote A Voice from the South in uh, 1892. And even um, many, Anna Julia and Cooper. And studied at the Sorbonne, no? Did she? Was that um, or Mary Church Terrell? No? Uh, I can't remember. Okay. But um, I'll think of it by the mm -hmm. end of this thing. But I didn't. But many of the Anna Julia Cooper scholars didn't even know this essay, and so that's one reason that we reprinted it. And Hollis Robbins and I reprinted it in our um, Penguin uh, 19th Century uh, African American um, Women's Writings anthology as well. So, so just you know, and the complicated piece of this, and I know Maria, you've talked about this, that uh, Joel Chandler Harris complicated it because in some ways he was saving it, but he also made this something that people felt ashamed of. So let's talk a bit, a bit about it. It's that. so interesting because Skip is talking about the disavowal of folk tales by the black community. And then at the same time, you have Joel Chandler Harris who says, I've got to write volumes and volumes. He didn't just produce one volume, but he spent his entire life producing collections of black folk tales in dialect. Uh, but many of you who know that collection also know that it's framed by a conversation between Uncle Remus and a little white boy. So suddenly these tales, this entire cultural legacy is handed over, not just to a white person, a child, but it's moved into the culture of childhood. So now this happens in the European tradition as well. That is, these stories from the childhood of culture suddenly become children's fare. The oral story tradition, oral storytelling tradition dies out. 
And then suddenly these tales become cartoon versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. So you get the Song of the South, where they literally are cartoons, uh, children's fair. And yet, I think one of the things we forget is that the folklore has not vanished. It has not gone away. It's still here. I think it's Langston Hughes who says, it's still here. Mm -hmm. I love that phrase, still, quiet, but mm -hmm. it's also here. And, and it surfaces in Toni Morrison, who writes a novel called Tar Baby, mm -hmm. or incorporates flying Africans, myths about flying Africans, into the Song of Solomon. So it, it has this strange way of, uh, there's a kind of disappearing and reappearing mm -hmm. act. Uh, and, and these strange moves, appropriations, and reappropriations uh, of the tales. I sort of think that in many ways, these are stories that are cross-generational. They also belong to all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, the human mind thinks everywhere alike. And in working with Skip on this collection, one of the things that I discovered is that there is this golden chain of folklore, of folk tales that connects all of us. You know, it's true. Yeah. I would say the, the metaphor I've used is underground and above Separate, ground. Yeah. That they, yeah. they're underground and then they, come, they, they surface. Right. I asked the driver in preparation for this. A man picked me up from the car service. At the, thank you for taking <laughs> <laughs> And um, it was an African-American man. I happen to know his name, but I, don't want, I didn't get his permission to recount what I'm going to recount, so I'm not going to mm. say it. But Marie and I always argue about the Song of the South. And I just wanted to, a reality check. So I said to him, his first name is David, I'll say that. I said, David, did you ever watch the Song of the South? He's about my age. He said, man, I love the Song of the South. Uncle Remus? He said, nobody told me it was racist until political correctness came along and people decided <laughs> it was racist, right? But I said, did you think it was racist? He said, no, we loved it. And in my household, we loved We watched Disney and there was Br'er Rabbit and there was Br'er Bear. And mm -hmm. um, I remember when I read Alice Walker wrote that famous yeah. essay saying how racist it was. And I went like, what version of the Song of the South did Alice see? You know? <laughs> Maybe I had the expurgated, uh, <laughs> the unracist version. They took the racist part. So I bought it. You, I, you know, you could go online yeah. and, and you could buy it. And um, the guy who played Calhoun on, Am on Amos and Andy, mm -hmm. Algonquin J. Calhoun, um, did the, the voice of Br'er Rabbit. And when you hear that, you go, well, it's exaggerated. But when I was growing up, my father, we had Joel Chandler Harris right next to Mother Goose. And um, my father told my brother and me Br'er Rabbit stories all the time. But he didn't do it in an exaggerated voice. He would just say, oh, Br'er Rabbit, then there was a tar baby. You know, it wasn't written in that exaggerated dialect that Joel Chandler yeah. Harris used, which I think changes your relationship to the stories well, I, I noticed when I was teaching the Uncle Remus stories, we read some of the tales out loud. And everyone became really uncomfortable because we realized we were entering into this minstrelsy tradition. Mm -hmm. We're kind of imitating uh, the voice of Uncle Remus. Mm -hmm. And so, so these stories, it's, you know, they were so popular in the 90s and the early part of the 20th century. And who reads Uncle Remus today? I, well, you did, I guess. But <laughs> how many in this audience grew up with Uncle Remus stories just as a, well, 10%, 15%? Yeah, 50%. So. I'm counting over here. <laughs> oh, <you're so> <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. We know that story. But, you know, but those are those themes. It's really about those themes of the underdog mm -hmm. being witty and being sly. Yeah. So what are, the, what are some of the themes? Because, Maria, you've done... The Brothers Grimm, Hans Christian Andersen, and those have their certain themes. What are the themes that you saw there and the themes that really stand out in African-American folk tales? I think the, the emphasis on language, for one thing, and I hope we get a chance to uh, visit the talking skull and stories like that. And as Skip said, these stories offer opportunities for uh, reflection for thinking. Uh, so language is used in these extraordinary clever ways and the tales shock and startle. 
Uh, now, all fairy tales, all folklore, I think, has a way of incorporating high coefficients of weirdness. Uh, <laughs> it's part of what fascinates me. About. So you finish the story and you think, wait, what is going on here? And you start, there's a reflex to start talking about it. So I think the emphasis on language, uh, reflection, intellection, courage mm -hmm. also, um, not kindness so much as I would say, uh, what would you, uh, kindness and treachery. Mm -hmm. uh, if kindness is raised, it's always in the context of treachery. So these wonderful dialectical relationships that come up in the tales, and as Skip and I, I we've talked about this, the way that these stories really take up these deep cultural contradictions, uh, nature versus nurture. How do you come to turn? How do you talk about? How do you think that through? What is more important? And actually, I think this would be a great opportunity for you to tell a story that you told me three years ago about the scorpion and the frog, mm. which takes up the whole nature nurture question. And you know, do you want to read it or do you want to tell I'd it? I'd rather tell it. Is that <laughs> yeah. okay? No, I'm, I'm ready for it. I have one, after you finish that, I have one other question, but then I want okay. to No, 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 keep going, because I want you to tell stories. Okay, <laughs> but I would there add to is. your list, and that's a great list, I would add wit. You wit, know, wit, yeah. wit was always celebrated. Imagination, the fact that, the, you know, the, the Tar Baby story is all about, you know, this poor little rabbit stuck, the fox is going to eat him, and he convinced him to throw him in the briar patch, the place where he would be the safest. And it's an amazing story. Mm -hmm. Just an amazing story. And, and again, it's also about passive resistance. Absolutely. I mean, what an, what a, what an allegory. And that, for Toni Morrison, the, of all of the folk tales that she could have used to allegorize, she picked the Tar Baby story, which is incredible, remarkable. And we know the Tar Baby story in the form that we do because of Joel Chandler Harris. Now, you could say all you want about Joel Chandler Harris and this, the device she used with mm -hmm. the, the device he used with the little white boy, but he was the first major collector and publisher of African American folklore. And he, so the two legacies, one, those volumes, but secondly, Charles Chestnut was a um, legal secretary, legal clerk, right? And he's reading Joel Chandler Harris, and he says, if this white guy could do it, I'm black. <laughs> I could do it better. And he started writing fiction. He was the first black author published in the Atlantic Monthly and then published The Conjure Tales. And he did it in a, in a, a different way. But here's the story of the Scorpion and the Frog. This is the way my father told it. You'll see a different version in this book. Um, mm -hmm. Islands on fire. And, um, it, you know, if you stay on the island, you're going to die. And so all the animals are, you know, lined up along the, the shore and they got somehow get to the adjacent island. And the frog is cool, because the frog can swim. The scorpion can't swim. So the frog's ready to depart, and the scorpion's his mortal enemy. And the scorpion says, Mr. Frog, Mr. Frog, <laughs> save me, save me, please save me. I'm going to die, I'm going to burn to death. And the frog says, man, you've been mean to me, you old scorpion. Why should I help you? He goes, look here, Mr. Frog. Why would I be mean to you? I'm going to ride on your back. I just want to ride on your back. You're going to uh, swim over to that island, and I get off, and then we go back to normal business. But I, I, why would I hurt you? You're going to save my life. The frog thought about it and said, well, I don't want that on my conscience. So damn, okay, get on my back. So the frog is doing what frogs do, getting to the adjacent islands halfway uh, through the water. And he goes, this is a pretty good thing. I'm, I, I know I will have saved one of my fellow creatures. And as he's thinking of that, zap! Like a bolt of lightning, he feels the sting of the scorpion. And he realizes the scorpion has done his worst fear, his, his nightmare. The scorpion has stung him, and he's going to die. And as he's sinking under water, he looks up at the scorpion and says, Mr. Scorpion, Mr. Scorpion, why? Why did you do that? We're, gonna, we're both going to die. And the scorpion says, because it's my nature. Can I take the That's a cold story. Can I take the story back to Africa? Yes, uh, ma'am. There is a tale which is called A Vital Decision. And the same question about nature nurture comes up in that in that story. I'm not a storyteller like Skip, but I will try to 
um, give you a sense of what goes on. It was recorded by a strange German anthropologist named Leo Frobenius. Oh, yeah. So it begins with a rat catcher who is an abusive father. Uh, he slaps his son ar around. The son finally <laughs> is fed up and leaves. He's then adopted by a rich man who feeds him, clothes him, educates him. One day, the, uh, the rat catcher comes back to reclaim his son. And, um, and the wealthy man is, is truly upset. They are at a crossroads. And the wealthy man says to the, says to the boy, I'm going to put a sword in your hand. And you must choose. You must either kill your biological father mm -hmm. or kill me. Mm. And I will read you <coughs> the end of the story as recorded by Frobenius. Uh, the young man stood between the two men with the sword drawn. Should he kill his father, the man who had raised him, but who had also nearly killed him for the sake of a rat? Or should he kill the rich man, the man who had helped him and made him wealthy? which meant that he would be returning to catching rats. He had no idea what to do. And if the three are not already dead, then they are no doubt still standing there. Oh. Mm. So uh, you could imagine uh, if this story were told, you would have to start talking about it, mm -hmm. uh, figure out what is more important, what matters. And here we get back to that whole question of reflection, thinking more, thinking harder. I love the fact that Einstein, Einstein's advice to parents, if you want intelligent children, read them fairy tales. Mm -hmm. If you want more intelligent children, read them more fairy tales. So. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. But, and so what, you know, why is this a perfect time for this book to come out? We need the wit. We need the ability to think. Why is this a good time? Mm. Um, start with <laughs> flying Africa. <laughs> Skip, you have to read. Because we're under siege. <laughs> the American imagination is under siege right now, as far as I'm concerned. But, um, but you know, just, I mean, so be, I, want, I want you all to read some stories, but I do want to ask you about flying, because that is, you know, pertains to now. But all right, so we'll do this together. I'll do the first part, and then yeah. you do the second. Yeah. All right, the story of the flying, it's called The Flying Man. I heard about the flying man up in Arkansas, Jonesboro. The police went up to him, and the faster they walked, the faster he walked, until he just spread his arms and sailed right on off. And they never did catch him. Said he was faster than the planes. They told about him all through the South, in Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas. Relevance, yeah. Uh, so flying Africans, and this is a story that many of you will be familiar with because it appears, a version of it appears in Virginia Hamilton's The People Could Fly. Uh, this is All God's Children Could Fly. Uh, I'm going to give an abbreviated version of it. it. It starts with a young woman in the fields picking cotton. She's just given birth. Uh, she is suffering in those fields and the overseer is there with his whip and uh, begins to strike her with his lash. And then suddenly, and hear the importance of language, um, the young woman hears words being chanted, and they're not familiar to her. It's African, uh, African words being chanted by an old man, by the elder in the group. And she rises up and flies, flies away as the old man is is chanting the words. Uh, then the driver hurried, hurried the rest to make up for her loss, and the sun was very hot indeed. And then suddenly the entire group begins, uh, takes off, takes flight. The master, the overseer, and the driver looked after them as they flew beyond the wood, beyond the river, miles on miles, until they passed beyond the last rim of the world and disappeared in the sky like a handful of leaves. They were never seen again. Yeah. And I, maybe you want to talk about the Igbo landing. And, and the Igbo landing yeah. was Paul Marshall. Remember Paul Marshall, uh -huh. the great novelist? She wrote about Igbo landing, and that's part of the uh, African-American tradition that their slaves come. Igbo, by the way, we know from uh, David Eltis's Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, which any of you could look up. You know, It's an accessible uh, website. Um, 
16% of our ancestors who came enslaved from Africa, 16% came from um, eastern Nigeria, what's now eastern Nigeria. And a high portion of them would, would be Igbo. So Igbo's very much part of the African American um, culture statistically through um, the slave trade. So at Igbo Landing, these slaves came, and they weren't going to put up with slavery. And so they, they, what was their choice? So they all just one day, they walked to the shore, head back to Africa, and just walk in the water, Igbo Landing. And what's, um, and that's told with great admiration. And what's common to the stories of walking back to Africa, you know, drowning or flying, which is Tony Morris in the Song of yeah. Solomon, is it's a form of suicide. That you had to, I mean, we could romanticize and say, yes, they flew, but no, but they didn't. They jumped off cliffs like Solomon, and they, that was it. Um, so it was a form of liberation, but what the cost was your own life. And if all the slaves had committed suicide, all the black people here would disappear, right? <laughs> Unless you're a recent African mm. immigrant. So it's very complicated. The accommodation that our ancestors made with slavery, like they bided their time so that we would be here. That's an amazing choice. Defer, you talk about the ultimate example of deferred gratification mm -hmm. is when you say, you know, there's another day coming. We're going to pick this cotton. We're going to you know, live this horrible life. But one day, our descendants will be free. And to believe that and to reshape Christianity in your own image to invent songs, uh, to talk about rabbits and, and, and bears and, and foxes and allegorize your own condition so that you could protest and the master wouldn't kill you, um, to steal a little learning from the white man, as Frederick Douglass puts it, to try to master uh, the ABCs, and to do that hundreds of years so that we would be here, it just brings te tears to mind. I mean, just the, the sacrifices that our ancestors made so that we could be the great African-American people of 42 million from the original 388,000 that came directly from Africa is one of the greatest tales ever told. And so when you want to know my motivation for doing African-American studies generally and for doing the work I do in, in this great project with Maria is to bear witness to the triumph of our people's soul. And that's... Talk about that journey, the connection, connecting it to Africa, going through the period of slavery, coming out of slavery. There's a difference between some of the rural stories and some of the urban stories. So, oh, yeah. yeah, talk about, about that. You want the world? Well, can I do And then you can do, I know you want to do yeah. signifying much. I want to do shine in the Titanic. <laughs> okay. I can't wait. That too. <laughs> you want to talk first or you want me to read? You go ahead. I think, no, read. Go ahead. Okay. I think we should go straight. All right. And then, then we'll can, talk about then you do it. rural urban. Now, I, my brother and I first heard of shine in the Titanic um, from daddy. My father was a great storyteller and he was funny. My father made Red Fox look like an undertaker. <laughs> I don't know where daddy is, but wherever he is, he's in heaven or somewhere. He's cracking jokes and talking about it. Shine. One of the great things, and not many scholars have written about this, but one of the great things about segregation even in World War II was in the army is that it cross-pollinated black communities. Because all of, Charles Davis was my mentor at Yale, first black American to get tenure in the English department. He went to Dartmouth before the war, and he and my father were both stationed at quartermaster camp in Petersburg, at oh. Camp Lee, Virginia, in Petersburg. And this was a black man. My father was had graduated from high school and was, would work at the paper mill when he, he got out. And Charles Davis had a BA in English from Dartmouth, and they both were there at Camp Lee, Virginia. And my father would tell my brother and me that he knew, knew all these black men he met all these black men from Mississippi and Alabama who basically were illiterate. And, but they could, <laughs> they could recite, Daddy would say, a thousand verses of Shine the Titanic and the Signifying Monkey. And he had never heard of this stuff. And he memorized it and he would tell us, but he would tell us in the uh, cleaned up versions because they were, they were filthy, filthy dirty. <laughs> Sexist, dirty, trash talking. And one of the, my favorites, and I wrote a book called The Signifying Monkey. I got tenure, The Signifying Monkey. But Shine in the Titanic. 
And the story is apocryphal. The story is that Jack Johnson, we all know Jack Johnson, Jack Johnson you know, had a white wife or a white girlfriend, and he wanted to ride on the main voyage of the Titanic. This is apocryphal. It never happened. But this is what the black tradition says. And the, you know, Marcus Garvey said the Black Star Line I'm going to take us to Africa. It's because uh, the Cunard Line was the White Star Line. And Titanic was the new ship in the White Star Line. And according to tradition, they wouldn't let Jack Johnson on because they were racist, right? So it was all these white people. So it's like an allegory like serves you right. And it's a terrible thing to say, but that's what the tradition said. Except there was one black man. Now, in reality, there was one black man. We didn't even know this until recently. He was a Haitian. Um, and who died and his wife and child uh, lived. He really was on there, and you could look this up. But uh, the, in the black tradition, there's one black man who, of course, is working in the boiler room, and he's shoveling coal. And his name is Shine. And for those of you who don't know, Shine is a metonymic insult for black people because when your skin is uh, perspiring and you're dark, you shine, right? So you shines, or, you know, shines were black people. So, um, Almost as soon as the news of the Titanic broke, some genius in Harlem had invented this poem. <laughs> and the poem has a zillion um, verses. You know, you can riff on it all day long. But this is the version that we used. It was 1912 when the awful news got around that the great Titanic was sinking down. Shine came running up on deck, told the captain, please, the water in the boiling room is up to my knees. Captain said, take your black self on down there. Take it, no, Captain said, take your black cell phone back down there. I got 150 pumps to keep the boiler room clear. Shine went back in the hole, started shoveling coal, singing, Lord have mercy, Lord, on my soul. Just then half the ocean jumped across the boiler room deck. Shine yelled to the captain, water's around my neck. Captain said, go back. Neither fear nor doubt. I got 100 more pumps to keep the water out. Shine said, your words sound happy and your words sound true. This is one time, Captain, your words won't do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like chicken, and I don't like ham, and I don't believe your pumps is worth a damn. <laughs> <laughs> Old Titanic was beginning to sink. Shine pulled off his clothes and jumped in the brink. He said, little fish, big fish, shark fishes too. Get out of my way because I'm coming through. <laughs> Captain on bridge hollered, shine, shine, say for me. I'll make you rich as any man could be. Sean said, there's more gold on land than there is on the sea. <laughs> and Shine swam on. When all them white folks went to heaven, Shine was in Sugar Ray's bar drinking <laughs> Seagram 7. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there are different variants. Like Mrs. Rockefeller, or no, M Mr. Astor would say, I can't do the, it's so sexist, I can't do that one. But you can imagine, like uh, uh, Mr. Astor or Mr. Rockefeller would say, floating on an ice floe, say, shine, shine, save for me. I'll give you all the money and shine could see. And shine said, money good, money don't last. Shine going to save his own black ass. <laughs> <laughs> and then the refrain is, and shine, swam on. <laughs> and it's also riffing on the fact that black people ostensibly were not buoyant, right? That we somehow, we are the only human beings who couldn't swim. <laughs> so that's the urban version, 1912. But her yeah. question was the difference between the rural and the urban. Rural and urban, uh, that's a tough one mm -hmm. uh, because, of course, these traditions would have come from uh, rural uh, 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 storytelling situations. That is, uh, you're out in the fields and you've got the hollers and the songs. How do you entertain yourself? And well, there's another story called Two Bundles, which I hope we'll have a chance to look at, which um, tells, tells the story of, well, maybe I'll just... Yeah, do it uh, now. Do it. Two bundles in the road. One is really big, full of all kinds of things, and the black man runs out and gets it, and guess what is in it? A hoe, a shovel, a pickaxe. And the white man runs out and takes the little bundle, and guess what's in it? A pen and paper. Mm. A notebook. Isn't that amazing. Uh, so there you are. You do not have the instruments of writing. This is ephemeral cultural property. You're telling it in the fields. Uh, it's going to disappear. And then we get back to the question of who owns it? Who wrote it down? Uh, anthropologists wrote it down in in Africa. 
Uh, and then we have newspaper men, of all things, in the South who read Joel Chandler Harris and say, that's not right. I don't like the way he told that story. I heard a different version. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a, 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 variety, a range of people, again, many connected to the press, who decide that they want to preserve these stories. Uh, so what happens when uh, you move from the cities, from, from uh, the country to the city. And I think that's where the Hampton Institute comes into play. Yeah. And then also the aversion to these stories. Let, let's push them away. Let's disavow them. Let's keep them as far away as possible. Mm -hmm. Just about the time that the Joel Chandler Harris stories are becoming radioactive. Right. So folklore has a funny way of migrating back and forth from the country to the city. It, you know, just it, it tends to cross borders all the time. It's a transgressive art, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. And people in the black upper class were often embarrassed by these, you know, Rudy Boot songs, you know, or, <laughs> or, or yeah, that's the, the way it was. And if you read about the politics of respectability, as you so sagely said, in Evelyn Higginbotham's work, you'll see how it's, it's manifested. And fortunately, the Southern workmen, Hampton University, made the right decision, which was sent out black people to collect. And again, it was because Joel Chandler Harris was so popular, making so much money. And the American Folklore Society is founded in 1888. And a Harvard professor yeah. comes down and says to Hampton at this conference and says, look, this is really important. You really have to do it. And Anna Julie Cooper's there. And she goes, yes, we really do have to do it. And we can collect it better than these white people who are repeating songs that they heard from slaves or their nurse or their maid or, or whatever, and we're going to do it authentically. And all during the 1890s, um, they sent out students from Hampton, um, recent graduates from Hampton, faculty members, and they all would send in these stories that they had collected from and home. And it was a yeah. treasure tre chest, and we, we published them in one section in this book. So, yeah, yeah, along with Du Bois's Brownie's book, uh, that yeah. also made an effort, here again, oriented toward children. But these were magazines that were read by, uh, by parents to their children, by adults, again, cross-generational. Uh, but they are a second effort to preserve mm -hmm. and to, to recognize the importance of these stories in cultural identity. And, and again, you know, and just figuring out who you are, what you're doing he here, and what the dreams and aspirations were of your ancestors. As Toni Morrison says, listen to the ancestry. Uh, what were their dreams? What were their hopes? What were the struggles that they had, the conflicts that they dealt with? Um, the despair that they felt, you know, it's uh, mm -hmm. sort of all, all there, and you just have to figure it out. Or the yeah. opposition between work and, you know, arduous manual labor and mm -hmm. reading and writing through that. So that's amazing, you know, that somehow we got the work and the white man got the, the pen and ink and that they have more power through that. It's, it's very, Frobenius also tells us um, the story, and I wrote about this in The Signifying Monkey, of... Um, that the African was given a choice. This is the creation story. And there are many versions of these creation stories, which are really funny, like why black people are black. It was always at the expense of the, the you know, there would be five people and you had a choice. And God would say, uh, okay, today I'm going to give you a color. And the black man goes to sleep in the sun, and that's why, you know, we're darker and, and all that. But one of the, the Frobenius tells is that a, a black man was given a choice between all the gold in the world and reading and writing. And that ties into the fact that we forget this, that um, even late Middle Ages, before 1500, um, most of Europe's gold uh, uh, came from West Africa. And there's a story, of course, of Mansa Musa, the great emperor, who's, if you Google networth.com, mm -hmm. at least a year ago, the richest man in the history of the world was Mansa Musa, whose wealth is estimated at $400, million, $400 billion. And he was the emperor of, uh, of Mali. And he made a pilgrimage in 1324, 1325 to Mecca and had so much gold it devalued the, the price of gold in, uh, in Europe, for, uh, in, in Egypt and in the Middle East for a, a long time. The point is, in ancient Egypt, the gold came from Nubia. In uh, the Middle Ages, the gold came from uh, Mali. In another period, the gold came from Western uh, Zimbabwe. So Africa has been a source of gold in 
to, to the world and particularly the West for a long time. So this is the allegory. The African's given a choice. What do you want, all the gold in the world or the ability to read and write? And the African for Venus tells us. And he's just recording uh, folk tales from yeah. an African. And the African chose all the gold in the world. But the beauty of that story is that Which African is the wrong choice. Also, <laughs> well, the African also chose to tell a story mm -hmm. uh, and made something from nothing. And that's sort of the rejection of wealth and gold and, and the richness of the storytelling tradition. So I love the way that these stories, are just, they contradict them. So they send yes. these messages, and then they, they force you to think a little bit about the message that is being sent and to realize that you know, these are deceptively simple tales. Um, and they're deceptively simple and simply deceptive. Yes. And you have to start thinking about why this tale was told and how it's been handed down, and what different generations have made of the story. Well, and, and, and you know, reading Maria's work, Maria is the queen of folktale analysis of mythology, and <laughs> she would, um, you know, I was thinking about Grimm, the key word there is Grimm. Grimm. I mean, exactly. these stories were yeah. weird. You know, some old person eating children, and you know, what the hell is that about? This is not how I want to go to sleep. Hands on cradle, getting lost, about to be boiled, or whatever it is. You know, yeah. the, the fact oven. that they are yeah. dilemma tales, as you put yeah. it, and that yeah. they are, they are odd and they are scary. What do you have to kill your father or your adoptive father? What? And the and the answer is, it is indeterminate. There is no right answer There's to no that. Right answer. And if you're still, if if they're still there, they're still he's still poised with the sword, trying yeah. to decide who to kill. Yeah, that's hard work, man. So <laughs> so, it, among your favorite stories, I mean, I would love for you to, to read some and tell some more. But I am curious how you made the selection because there's such a wide range. Mm -hmm. Just so when people pick up the book, they'll know go here to go take a look at Zora Neale Hurston or read something about the flying, you know, all God's children. You know, what were the things that were really important mm -hmm. to you to include? Well, I would say it was an immersive experience. I mean, there you are standing over the cauldron of story. Mm -hmm. And it's not just African American, but Africa. And I've always made a vow, you know, I can't analyze things in, that are uh, written in a language that I don't know, a culture that I don't know. So. I, when uh, Bob Weil, our editor, proposed the collaboration, I remember I thought, no, this is terra incognita. I can't possibly do this. I said, yes, you can. <laughs> and, uh, and then I, you know, I thought about this. It was as if there were a, a blank slate, a gigantic canvas, or a huge jigsaw puzzle in front of me with a million pieces. And the only way to do it was in a totally unscientific way, unsystematic which was just to read and keep reading. And I had the good fortune of being at the Hutchins Institute and uh, uh, working with other scholars there and just going from one thing to the next. And suddenly, the big picture emerges. You begin to see, here, here are areas that I really want to highlight. And so the organization, once the organization became clear, it was easier. But then the organization became clear and Skip then came to me and said, what about the Southern workmen? <laughs> <laughs> so there was a lot of rejiggering and uh, We approached reworking. it in co yeah. completely opposite ways. Um, you know, Hurston uses the, one of the great, uh, and one of the earliest collections of black folk tales by a black person, Mules and Men, of course, by Zora Neale Hurston, 1935. And she uses uh, two uh, uh, metaphors, one that the, what anthropology is fitting are like a girdle. Um, chemise. The, chemise, no. right, I'm sorry. A chemise. And, um, That's really different. It's very different, very different. <laughs> I think of it as, it fit, the scholarship sometimes fits you like two, like a spandex, is that what it's called? Okay, is that better? <laughs> and the other is the spyglass of anthropology. That she couldn't, you know, she wanted to go back home and collect folk tales. She said, okay, tell me a tale. Now, if my father were here, and I've told Maria this a million times, if, she had, if I'd taken her home to Piedmont and said, Mr. Gates, would you tell a tale? He'd say, I don't know what you're talking about. Because yeah. they would just tell the tale. It wasn't storytelling or tale telling. You know? and, and Hurston had to get over that. She tried to put people in this um, 
academic setting, a faux academic yeah, setting, yeah. and have them uh, tell a story. I wanted Maria, with her knowledge, extensive knowledge of mythology and folktale, to just read a thousand books of black folktales mm -hmm. and come at it from the broadest possible um, set of selections working downward. For me, I started with key canonical tales that I'd been raised with and which were important to me, like Shine the Titanic, The Signifying Monkey, Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Bear. So I started with my own canon. You know, we have 150 tales in. So there are probably a couple dozen things which were resonant to me as an African-American, someone of my generation, as a scholar of African-American studies, things like Tar Baby or Flying Africans. How could anybody in my field not think about those things or signifying or whatever. And th then we met. That's how we met. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, metaphorically met in terms of the finishing the table co contents. And then she had a selection. And then I thought, well, none of the Southern workmen are here. And then I worked my way backwards in this argument, which is something very important to me and I keep coming back to, which is the debates within the race about what blackness okay. is. I teach, uh, co-teach with Larry Bobo, a, a large lecture course at Harvard, which the kids call Blackness 101. It's an introduction <laughs> to African American studies. But it's about the debates that black people have had about what it means to be black. And black people have been debating what it means to be black since the first 20 black people got off the boat at Jamestown in 1619. There have always been, uh, <laughs> we used to tell the joke in West Virginia, the West Virginia Democratic politics was so divided, they didn't have factions, they had fractions. <laughs> and that's the same in the black community. My younger daughter, Eliza, would say, Daddy, back in the day, when black people were all united, I said, what day was that, Eliza? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, must have been before I was born. <laughs> so it, so uh, anyway. So we have about five more minutes. Is that um, all? I know. We just get more time. time. <laughs> well, five minutes in a few minutes. So just pick a, you know, each of you pick a story that you want to read or tell? Oh, gosh. I, I'm going to think about it. The gopher who goes to court, I don't know whether I can reconstruct it, but for some reason it comes to mind. He goes to court, and he looks around, and he sees that the judge is an owl. <laughs> the jury is full of owls, and the lawyers are all owls, and he says, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> and he just leaves and decides that he's going to try to find a new location for his trial. Mm. And uh, it's called Blood is Thicker Than Water. And that's the punchline that I failed to give you. Uh, blood is thicker than water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and it's a, I'm trying to remember, I, I think Zora Neale Hurston has a version of it. But there are, again, it's one of those stories, there are hundreds of different versions of it. Like, you better watch out. You mm -hmm. better be careful. And there is a distinction between us versus them. And uh, you need to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. so, oh, are you, and uh, you're going to be consumed. Okay. Yeah, again, yeah, by the yeah. scorpion. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, well, if I could find it, I'm looking for the signifying monkey. Ah. Let me see. It's Shine the Titanic. Titanic. See, that's how black people talk. Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, okay. Here's the signifying line. But it's a little bit long. I don't know yeah. if we well, have... Well, no, so, you have time. You, you sure? Time. I gave a short one. <laughs> the monkey and the lion got to talking one day. Monkey looked down and said, Lion, I hear you king in every way. But I know somebody who don't think that's true. He told me, he could whip the living daylights out of you. See, the three characters, monkey, lion, and the elephant. And everybody knows, that everybody knows that the, the conventional wisdom is that the lion is king of the jungle. But the real king of the jungle is the elephant. And that's what's important about the story. So, lion said, who? Monkey said, lion, he talked about your mama, he talked about your grandmama too. And I'm too polite to tell you what he said about you. <laughs> lion said, who said what, who? Monkey in the tree, lying on the ground. Monkey kept on signifying, but he didn't come down. <laughs> Monkey said, his name is Elephant. He's stone sure not your friend. Lion said, he don't need to be because the day will be his end. Lion took off through the jungle, lickety split, meaning to grab Elephant and tear him bit to bit. Come across Elephant, copping a righteous nod under a fine, cool, shady tree. Lion said, you big old no-good so-and-so, it's either you or me. 
Lion let out a solid roar and bopped Elephant with his paw. Elephant just took his trunk and busted old Lion's jaw. <laughs> Lion let out another roar, reared up six feet tall. Elephant just kicked him in the belly and laughed to see him drop and fall. Lion rolled over, copped Elephant by the throat. Elephant just shook him loose and butted him like a goat. Then he tromped him and he stomped him till the Lion yelled, oh no. And it was near nigh sunset when Elephant let Lion go. The signifying monkey was still sitting in his tree. <laughs> When he looked down and saw the lion, said, Why, lion, who could that there be? Lion said, It's me. Monkey rapped, Why, lion, you look more dead than alive. <laughs> lion said, Monkey, I don't want to hear your signifying jive. Monkey just kept on signifying. Lion, you for sure caught hell. Mr. Elephant's done whipped you to a fare thee well. Why, lion, you look to me, you've been in the precinct station and had the third degree. <laughs> Else you look like you've been high on gauge, which is marijuana. And Dunn got caught in a monkey cage. You ain't no king to me. Facts, I don't think that you could even as much as roar. And if you try, I'm liable to come down out of this tree and whip your tail some more. <laughs> monkey started laughing, jumping up and down, but he jumped so hard the limb broke and landed, bam, on the ground. <laughs> when he went to run, his foot slipped and he fell flat down. Grr, the lion was on him with his front feet and his hind. Monkey hollered, ow, I didn't mean it, Mr. Lion. Lion said, you little flea bag, you, while well, I'll eat you up alive. I wouldn't have been in this fix at all if it wasn't for your signifying jive. Please, said Monkey, Mr. Lion, if you just let me go, I've got something to tell you. Please, I think you ought to know. <laughs> Lion let the monkey loose. See, that's very similar to uh, Tar Baby. Mm -hmm. Lion let the monkey loose, see what his tail could be. The monkey jumped right back on up into his tree. <laughs> what I was going to tell you, said Monkey, is you square old so-and-so? <laughs> if you fool with me, I'll get elephant to whip your head some more. <laughs> Monkey said the lion beat to his unbooted knees. You and all your signifying children better stay up in them trees. Which is why today, Monkey does his signifying a way up out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to um, go upstairs in just a couple of minutes um, so that they can sign books. We're not going to have time for q and A. I know that's so much a part of what we, of what we do here, but uh, the schedule is a little tight. So closing thoughts on what people will get, what the reward will be for reading. Is it bedtime stories? We've already had some fun. People have laughed. I don't want, one of the reasons I wanted to do this, and I think we've agreed, I think that we'll do Africa next, is that we're in a position to canonize things. Um, these stories won't be lost again. They're in a volume, there are 150 of them, they're well annotated. Mm -hmm. Anybody, anywhere can use them, this volume to teach. It's dedicated, um, Maria's dedicated to her family and I've dedicated um, it to my granddaughter who's three years old. Um, and I quoted the Jewish expression, Lavor Devor, you know, from generation to generation. I want, you know, one of my fondest memories is thinking about my little bookshelf, and there was Mother Goose, and there was Uncle Remus. And, uh, you know, I read that stuff. And I want uh, little black kids and white kids and Asian kids and every other kind of kid to be able to have this volume on their shelf, in their bedroom, like, like I did, but in a, an, in a way that was not the most ideal way, as my friend uh, Dr. Tatar says, mm -hmm. because it was through Joel Chandler Harris. But now we're in a position, we have the authority to make a difference. And these stories won't be lost. We're also going to create a website, um, like a portal, because there there's many collections of black folk tales people's in this, people in this room. So we want to create a portal so anybody could have access to thousands <laughs> of these uh, folk tales and recordings of them. And some new ones will come. And new ones will come. Um, so that's why we've done what we have done at this moment to answer one of the first questions that, that you've asked. I think that's so important that is making it new. And I think both of us, uh, you know, these are only 150 stories. Uh, this is just a foundation and I think, um, uh, I love the idea of sequels and um, uh, new volumes that come out. And I want to just close by quoting Skip. <laughs> I was in the airport yesterday, and I did what Skip likes to do, which is to pick up a penguin.
volume to read on the plane. <laughs> and I look, and the introduction is by Henry Louis Gates Jr., <laughs> who quotes Faulkner. And this resonated with me so powerfully, and I think it answers your question. The aim of every artist is to arrest motion, which is life, by artificial means. So to arrest motion by artificial means and hold it fixed so that a hundred years later, when a stranger looks at it, it moves again, since it is life. Hmm. So bringing these stories back, and then what you write and what you produce, the way that you make it new, will come back in another, another century, we hope. And we hope. There we are. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we will see you in a couple of years with the African folk tale. So we'll see you outside where they'll be signing okay. books. Thank you all very Thank you, much Susan. for coming. Should we demo? Oh, behind the curtain, this way, dear. Oh, okay. The man behind the curtain.